Good afternoon. Uh, apologies for the slight delay, um, but uh, we can now kick off and start with the update that we want to give to everybody watching today. Uh, so today, today I'm joined by the Deputy Chief Minister, the Minister for Health and Social Services, and the Deputy Medical Officer of Health, uh, Dr. Ivan Muscat. And we're going to be outlining the government's winter strategy, which includes updates to our safer travel policy and lateral flow testing for islanders. First of all, just briefly, I'd like to address and apologise for the digital COVID status certification uh, issue that was identified uh, yesterday evening. Officials have been working right through the night uh, with Microsoft to resolve the issue, and I'd like to thank all of the officers who've been working on this matter to date. And I'd like just to remind my islanders that the, uh, this COVID status certification is a service for islanders travelling off island to countries that use vaccine certificates for domestic use or entry to their borders. It is not used internally or in Jersey or for islanders returning through our own borders. But we'll provide a further update as soon as possible when the service is back up and running. Now, the winter strategy will focus on safeguarding our public health without unnecessarily disrupting islanders' lives. The strategy sets out our commitment to islanders leading up to winter. And this includes continuing the good rollout of our winter vaccination programmes, keeping children and young people in school, keeping businesses open, and our critical national infrastructure operat operating and hospital occupancy at a sustainable level. Now we know that the colder weather of the winter period always increases the demand in our healthcare services and that respiratory diseases in particular can be more prevalent in colder weather. We continue to maximise the uptake of both the vaccines for COVID-19 and for seasonal flu <coughs> as we are expecting COVID-19 inf infection rates to fluctuate over the winter months. Now, our already high vaccination uptake means that this winter will be a different challenge to last winter, and this is evidenced by the data we are already seeing. So during the second wave of infection in Jersey, over the 2020, 2020 to 2021 winter, about 4% of all positive cases were hospitalised. In our third wave over summer 2021, so with the much more virulent Delta variant, only about 1% of cases were hospitalised. And the difference is our vaccination programme. So vaccination will also play an important role in managing seasonal flu and building on the success of last year's seasonal flu vaccine. And we are once more offering free flu vaccines to all islanders over the age of 50 and those in at-risk flu groups. We're making very good progress with our COVID-19 booster programme and we're in the final stages of completed, completing booster doses for care home residents in our island's residential homes. Since the vaccination programme launched, we've maintained the vaccination, that vaccination is our best defence against COVID-19 and this message remains over the winter period. The more people who are vaccinated, the sooner we can get back to full normality. And I urge all those eligible to get their flu or COVID booster vaccines to take up the offer as soon as they receive it. Doing so will help us to manage winter viruses and minimise the demands on our healthcare service this winter. Now, our winter strategy will also involve changes to our safer travel <coughs> policy and the extension of our lateral flow testing programme. And I'm going to be asking the Deputy Chief Minister and the Health Minister to outline these changes shortly. Most importantly, the winter strategy places an emphasis on the actions we can all take to make ourselves and those around us safer to avoid the need for imposed legal restrictions. If contingencies measures are needed, the strategy sets out a phased response starting with asking islanders to practice stronger voluntary measures such as working from home. Legal restrictions will always be the very last resort, and it's something we very much wish to avoid. We are all familiar with expressions like physical distancing, ventilation, and enhanced personal hygiene by now, but these are more than just slogans. Small, simple steps to promote COVID-safe behaviour really can be the difference between spreading COVID or containing it. Meeting friends or loved ones in smaller groups or choosing to meet outside rather than inside. Particularly respecting others' physical space or their right to wear a mask if they choose to. 
These are practical things which we can all do to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and do our part to keep Jersey safe this winter. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Senator Lyndon Farnham, Deputy Chief Minister, to outline the changes to the safer travel policy. Thank you. Thank you, um, John. I would li li now like to provide some important updates on our safer travel policy. Our safer travel measures are an important safeguard to public health while maintaining the essential connectivity the island needs to support our social and economic well-being. <clears throat> Since the beginning of the pandemic, our safer travel policy has remained under constant review in order to ensure it always reflects the changing circumstances, the emerging evidence, and the changing levels of risk. The changes we are proposing today that affect arrivals to Jersey are based upon the mitigations we have in place, including our excellent vaccination and now our booster coverage, which is providing a significant additional protection and defense against the virus. So from Tuesday the 2nd of November, that's immediately after half term, we will be easing testing requirements for passengers arriving in Jersey who meet the COVID status certification criteria. This means people who are fully vaccinated. So to be clear, anyone entering Jersey who is fully vaccinated, which is around 80% of arrivals, will no longer need to take a PCR test on arrival and will not be required to isolate. Passengers who can show evidence of recovering from COVID-19 in the last 90, day, 90 days will also not need to be tested or isolate. However, any arriving passengers who are not fully vaccinated will still be required to have a PCR test on arrival and to isolate until their result is received. Travellers who have only received one dose of the vaccine, including young people, that's the 11 to 17 age group, will require a PC test upon arrival and will have to isolate until the result is received. Those who have visited a UK red list country in the preceding 10 days will still need to be tested on arrival and at days five and days 10 and isolate for 10 days. We will maintain the option for unvaccinated passengers to undertake a PCR test within 72 hours of departure, which means they will not need to be tested or isolate on arrival, of course, subject to a negative result being presented. From the 2nd of November, there will be a simpler pre-departure registration form, which will ensure quicker arrivals process for all passengers. It remains important for all passengers, whatever their vaccination status, to complete the pre-order departure registration form within the 48 hours before their arrival in Jersey. And this is an especially important reminder that will help avoid delays as we enter the half-term period and the ports will be far busier than usual at this time. There is a gradual risk assessed uh, step down approach which draws on what we know about the virus and, and the protection afforded by the vaccination. <clears throat> Every passenger entering Jersey will need to meet safety criteria which provides a level of protection whether that's vaccination, recent recovery, pre-departure test or testing on arrival. As always throughout COVID we will carefully monitor the impact of these changes and amend our approach accordingly if necessary. In addition for islanders traveling abroad to those countries that require a form of vaccination passport, we have launched the Digital COVID Status Certification Scheme. The scheme has now been set up to allow islanders traveling abroad to show digital evidence of their COVID-19 vaccination in the form of a QR code. The codes are currently for use within the UK domestic certification schemes and France's Pass Sanitaire scheme. However, by working with the UK government, we will very soon be joining the EU Digital COVID Certificate Gateway, which will mean that Jersey's QR codes can be used for travel in Europe and further afield. I now pass uh, over to the Minister for Health and Social Services. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Lyndon. 
Uh, the COVID-19 testing strategy has been one of the cornerstones of Jersey's response to the pandemic. Without testing, even alongside our vaccination rollout, the virus still has the potential to present a serious risk to individuals and our community and to our health service. Regular testing forms part of the measures in which individuals can now commit to taking personal responsibility for their safety and behaviour. That is why, from the 26th of October, anyone aged 12 and over can register online to receive their lateral flow test kits directly to their home, allowing islanders to take responsibility for their own testing needs and make risk-based decisions. I'm pleased to see the extension of lateral flow testing to those who are not included in the current workplace or school testing programmes. It means we're offering a wide-ranging programme of testing that can be used by most islanders, including those who are not employed, retired or on any leave of absence, such as parental leave. This opportunity is open to all of us, regardless of whether we're currently registered on existing workplace or school LFT programmes. You can continue and take part in both. Home testing will provide increased opportunity to identify islanders who may be positive but not showing symptoms. The lateral flow tests are quick and easy to use and our new brand of Shore Screen kits returns results in just 15 minutes. That's half the time of the previous brand. You're advised to take tests at least twice a week but particularly at opportune moments ahead of social events such as parties or meeting with people you don't normally see or with those who are at risk. It's also advisable to take an LFT test once you arrive home in Jersey from travelling through our ports. When you get the tests, you will be given instructions on how to report the, the results. The online results portal should be accessed after every test taken to submit and confirm your results. The COVID safe team will be automatically notified of any positive LFT results input online and you will be contacted to organise your subsequent PCR test. If you do return a positive LFT test, please you should immediately go into isolation until confirmation of a negative PCR. More than 1,300 businesses have already registered with the lateral flow testing programme, which keeps their staff and customers safe. Many secondary students and education staff are regularly checking themselves with lateral flow tests. And we also continue to offer tests to direct contacts. These programmes remain open and you can still register for them online. It's important we continue to identify, isolate and slow the spread of the virus to protect not only our personal health, but the well-being and livelihoods of all islanders. Doing so maintains business continuity, supports school attendance and keeps our health and care services protected. The commitment of islanders to the testing programme throughout this pandemic has enabled loved ones to reconnect, businesses to operate safely and children and young people to be safe at school. So I urge everyone to take up regular testing in the winter months and register to receive your lateral flow kits from next week. I would also like to echo the Chief Minister's earlier sentiments about vaccination and use this opportunity to remind all eligible islanders about the vital importance of vaccination as we enter the winter months. If you are eligible for a booster COVID-19 vaccination or a free flu vaccination this winter, please make sure you take up that offer as soon as you can. Islanders who are eligible for a COVID-19 booster will be offered a free flu vaccination at Fort Regent when attending for their appointment. And thank you. I will now hand back to the Chief Minister. Thanks, Richard, and thanks, Lyndon.
So the plans we have announced today are designed to keep us safe this winter without unnecessarily disrupting the lives of islanders. The vaccine programme has reduced much of the threat posed by COVID-19 and allowed us to take a slightly different approach. But we must recognise that COVID is still dangerous, particularly if you've not been vaccinated. It remains a threat not only to our physical well-being, but also to disrupt our workplaces and schools, damage our economy or get in the way of our children's education. And this is why the lateral flow of testing to announced today is so important. As the Health Minister has outlined, it is now easier than ever to access your free lateral flow test kits, which will then be delivered to your home, allowing you to take responsibility for your own testing needs and make the right risk-based decisions for you. So whilst we are reducing the testing at the border in respect of those who are fully vaccinated, what we are replacing this with is an intention to test more people on a weekly basis using LFTs. We do rely on you as islanders to help us in this cause. If you register and take the tests, together we can protect the community even more than what we are doing at present. Getting tested will not only provide you with peace of mind, but also those around you. And remember, not everyone who has COVID-19 will have symptoms, but even if you're vaccinated, you can still pass it on to a colleague, a friend or a loved one. And we all have a part to play in limiting the spread of COVID this winter. And as we've said, there are practical and easy things we can all do to stay alert, get tested and stay safe. So thank you for listening so far. And we'll now take questions from the media. Have you not done this before, do I direct it at you, or do you generally go in? You, aim it, well, it depends. If you got a question directly for it's fine, or you send it to me and I'll either do a high-level or hand We'll ask you the to... first one. Then. Um, yep. So Guernsey authorities today have begun advising people uh, to wear masks when social distancing is not possible. Why are you not following a similar strategy, and does it not put the vulnerable mm -hmm. at risk, therefore, again? No, we've always made it very clear, and I think I said it in my, in my speech, that if uh, there are... Uh, members of the public who still feel the need or the wish to wear a mask, that if they want to, and it's obvious that also, or if it's obvious that um, members of the public are distancing themselves, is that for everybody else, please respect that. Uh, so that is that personal choice. But the, the point at this stage, and as we say, we keep monitoring significantly, uh, is we don't yet feel that there is a need uh, to, to go down a more um, mandatory route, shall we say. I think also uh, reiterate the point, and, and hopefully it, with the change to LFTs, it'll it, it'll increase. Actually, mm -hmm. um, the level of testing we continue to do is between sort of fifteen and twenty thousand a week. Uh, proportionately, that's huge uh, to anyone uh, in, in pretty well in pretty well any jurisdiction. And so, obviously, whilst we are seeing a slight uptick in cases at the moment, which we are monitoring quite closely. The, that level of testing that we're doing does give us early warning. And as we said, we're also moving that narrative away from the level of positive cases to the impact on hospitalisation. And as we've heard already, if you're vaccinated, the risk of being hospitalised is significantly less. But you now have a very doing. different strategy to Guernsey's again. Well, does we've... that worry you? Uh, no, because uh, we've always said that we don't try not to comment on other jurisdictions because we've got different strategies to the UK for the sake of argument. Um, we apply the strategy that we think is appropriate to the jurisdiction in the context of where we are, what our experience has been today, and obviously the infrastructure that we have to look after as well. And by that, I mean the health services and things like that. One question on lateral flow testing. This might be one for Dr Muscat. Yep. Um, much of your winter strategy seems to kind of hang on this lateral flow testing, which is voluntary, there will be lots of people who won't do it. It's just a fact. What do you say to those people? And because there will be people who won't do it, is it a flawed strategy? What we're saying is that as a result of vaccination, uh, the significance of COVID has changed and we're in a position to uh, embark upon a different approach to that which we used a year ago. Uh, part of that different approach is to give more personal responsibility to people 
to, uh, if you like, give them uh, the, the, uh, the freedom to look after themselves rather than us looking after them directly. Um, it does require, though, people to look after themselves, which is what they normally do. <laughs> and, uh, but within the context of COVID, uh, there are lateral flow tests which they can use as a tool given to them by the government to, to help themselves and to help others. If it is clear that despite the tools that are being given to the people, that numbers are going up, then, uh, of course, as always, we will have to uh, respond uh, accordingly and change our approach. Flexibility has always been included in all our policies and strategies to take into account the fluidity of the behaviour of COVID. You're suggesting people do it twice a week. What would you say to people who are thinking, I just can't be bothered? But they should really be bothered to look after themselves and to look after others in the same way as they do so in many other contexts. It is simply an extrapolation of the usual form of human behaviour, but now into the context of COVID. Many thanks. Great. Okay, we'll hop in and out of online and in the, and in the room. So shall we go to Fiona from Bailiwick? Thank you very much, uh, Ministers, Dr Muscats. Um, how much is the government saving as a result of uh, removing the uh, PCR testing for fully vaccinated travellers? We know that there's going to be an 80% drop in PCR testing as a result of that. Um, and to what extent was the rationale for uh, moving from expensive PCR tests um, in that context to cheaper LFPs an economic one? Who wants to uh, respond? Ivan, do you want to give uh, the overall? Because that's... Yeah. Um, Certainly, you're, you're, you're right that the uh, number of PCR tests undertaken at the border will decrease by about 80% because 80% uh, uh, of uh, arrivals are fully vaccinated and therefore do not require a PCR. Uh, PCR testing will continue for non-vaccinated or people who are not fully vaccinated at the borders and will continue on island mm. for a number of other uh, groups of people. Um, we are, however, supplementing uh, that change with uh, a very large number of repeated LFT tests uh, uh, for now available for the population as a whole, not just subgroups. Um, and that broad coverage, repeated coverage, should allow us to pick up um, more infection in a more timely fashion and therefore protect individuals uh, to a greater extent. Um, the, the thinking behind it uh, has been that and not monetary. It has been uh, giving people, uh, the, the uh, empowering people to look after themselves um, and uh, at the same time uh, increasing our scrutiny of uh, uh, COVID infection in the population as a whole. It also gives people the opportunity to undertake lateral flow tests, uh, not just on a routine basis, but in relation to specific events which may increase the risk of transmission of COVID, for example, large gatherings uh, or in relation to travel um, uh, and, and so forth. So there are a number of advantages to this. Um, uh, in, and whereas PCR testing alone uh, can only be undertaken sporadically in the main. So the coverage we get now is pretty good. Okay, uh, do you want to go for a second question? Um, I, I was just wondering, before I do that, if, if ministers, I might ask you to be able to jump in there and, and just um, advise on the uh, potential saving from that. I know that um, while there is a great advantage in moving to this LFT programme in terms of the coverage that uh, Dr Muscat has outlined, I know that it's been something on your minds for a while, um, the cost of tests. I know earlier in the year it was even discussed um, whether or not there should be a charge for border testing. So might you be able to comment on the economics there? Um, I don't have the specific uh, details to hand. I don't know if either Richard or Lyndon do. Uh, it's obviously clear that um, uh, LFTs are cheaper than the um, uh, PCRs. Uh, equally, uh, as we've said previously, we have been putting some resource into um, bringing the testing lab into the hospital itself. Uh, so, and when that uh, eventually goes fully live, um, that will also significantly reduce the cost of PCRs as a whole. 
and I believe that's down to about 15 to 20 pounds. I'm looking at Ivan to give me a rough indication there. Um, but the, um, uh, I think we've just got to emphasize it hasn't been cost driven this. This has been about an evolution through, which is why we've not particularly been focusing on the cost. And also, it's always a point in time, isn't it? Because um, if circumstances change and we have to go back, then, uh, um, uh, then you know, it, it's, it's not a relevant factor at this stage. There will be a benefit if things carry on as they are. The focus, as we've said, has always got to be about delivering uh, the, the right uh, lives and livelihood solutions in, in that context. But we can, uh, obviously, uh, come back to with the fuller details, if that helps. Okay. Thank you um, for that. Um, just on the uh, lateral flow testing program, in the run-up to Christmas, potentially tens of thousands of islanders will be wanting to get tested so that they can either go to festive events or mm -hmm. spend time with all the relatives, for example. What turnaround time will you be guaranteeing them with that uh, program, and what staffing resource have you put in place to ensure that the tests can be processed in a timely manner, uh, manner during this critical festive period you were talking about lateral flow weren't you because the yes, the right. point the, the, whole, the, the flow program yes the whole point of the lateral flow is that um obviously you do it yourself so you will receive your kit it'll have about 25 i think you'll get a box it's got about 25 uh tests in a box and um uh, and obviously you just work your way through them so um the turnaround time is 15 minutes uh, basically, and um, and therefore, and as uh, as Bruce been said, it is an element of common sense as well. I.e., if you are going to a big event, it would make sense to get that test done, and be sensible about it, please. And um, you know, do respect to that. If actually you do turn positive, you know, be sensible. Please don't go to the event. So perhaps I should have just been slightly clearer on that question, not yep. the turnaround time of the tests themselves, but rather being able to send the packs to islanders that request them, um, ensuring that they can get to islanders. So the, the start really date is the 26th of October, that will be when they're available, and uh, it's being done through Jersey Post, so we expect it's literally the delivery time of, we expect within a day or so, mm -hmm. of, of the request coming in. That's the anticipation. Obviously, we've had further discussions about, uh, you know, lit that's the kind of first stage. If there's more improvements we need to do, we'll, we'll deal with them at the time. But it should be pretty swift. Thank you for that. Anything else to add that I've missed? No? no. Okay. Right. Uh, we'll go into these, uh, come into the room. Uh, Freddie. Uh, thank you, Ministers. Dr. Muscat, Freddie Miller from BBC Jersey. Um, firstly, on the, the testing changes at the border, um, if I could ask about the timing of this um, and also about one of the details of it. Firstly, on the timing, uh, we know from Stack Minutes that this was discussed um, in August, that we might be dropping mm -hmm. some testing in November. Obviously, the situation in August was very different than the situation in November, but one might conclude that the decision was kind of made in August for November, and now we're having what was discussed. So as for the timing of this, of course, when we also have cases rising, um, we've heard earlier about um, new measures being brought in in Guernsey, also calls from doctors in the UK for measures to be tightened. If you put all that together, um, can you can you say categorically that this decision made today is taking into account factors today and it's not a decision that was made in August despite whatever changes may occur? Um, and secondly, on the testing at the borders, um, you've mentioned that people who are only single vaccinated will continue to have to have a PCR test. Of course, young people are only being offered one PCR, uh, one vaccine at the moment. Therefore, that makes them arguably fully vaccinated as per their eligibility. So is there a fairness or unfairness there? Those two questions, please. I'll let Ivan deal with the vaccination side and, and, and also top off on whatever I missed when I give the answer to the first part of the question, unless anybody else wants to come in. The, um, I, in essence, when the discussions took place in August around where we were in testing, <laughs> the earliest that it could have been done was around, the, I think it was the 19th of October. And so we did revisit... Um, when we were a lot closer to that time. So although discussions were happening in August, discussions continued through September. And I'm going to say, I can't remember the, the final date we um, did the consideration, but I'm going to say either end of September or beginning of October was when we kind of reaffirmed and actually talked about the date. And, uh, and essentially we had two choices uh, on the dates. One was um, around the 19th, 20th of October, obviously. And the second one, which actually was my preferred option, was to do it just after half term which was then to 
Uh, there obviously is more travel at half terms. It just gets us past that period, and then hopefully, and then also gives it time to uh, bed things down and get systems into the right place. Um, anybody yeah, want to add? Just yeah. add John, these things are continually monitored. It's not yeah. that once they're uh, discussed in August, then it's set in stone. And it remains the public health advice that this is a proportionate risk-based approach uh, that is in accordance with the stack advice and uh, takes account of the, f the protections that are available by vaccination already. Um, so we, we've discussed that more recently than August, at the beginning of this month, and um, it, it remains the case that this is a, a proportionate thing to do. And of course, We'll always be monitoring things, and if, as the Chief Minister said, if it needs to change again, it can do. Ivan, do you want to deal with the second part? Um, oh, yeah, if I can touch upon uh, one aspect of the first uh, part of your question, um, we do need to bear in mind as well that uh, the PCR testing in the airport uh, of late has been one PCR test on arrival. Uh, and that only picks up about 50% maybe of incoming infections because you can be PCR negative on arrival but become positive three or four days later. And we wouldn't be picking that up unless you're symptomatic, declare yourself, etc. The uh, LFT tests, uh, the lateral flow tests, uh, al uh, allow people to very easily test themselves repeatedly in the t for the 10 day period after return. So there is the wherewithal to pick up infection more than a single PCR uh, on arrival. And we should take advantage of that uh, possibility. Uh, and we urge people to do so. It is in their interests and the interests of others that, that we all be as safe as possible. In terms of the second question, um, you're right. It is uh, something that we need to contend with. What is the definition of full vaccination? So the, the simple answer is the degree of protection you get two weeks after your second jab uh, if, if, if you're an immune competent individual. If that is the gold standard, then one, what happens when that immunity wanes? Should full vaccination for people over the age of 50 uh, become uh, a, the addition of a booster six months or more afterwards to retain that status. So we need, we are contending with that question now. The second uh, part of that is what do we do with people who have only received one vaccine? And the current um, uh, understanding is that we can't grant full vaccination status to people who have only received one vaccine because the degree of protection afforded is good but not the equivalent of full vaccination. If there is international agreement that we should change that for the under 18s or under 16s, then of course we will do so. But at the moment, there is no such international agreement. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying. Second question. Uh, second question, um, in relation to, you've obviously set out the plan now based upon what we know now. Um, if things change, uh, you've suggested that you'd first maybe uh, ask people to work from home or to think about working from home. Legal restrictions would only come in later down the line. But what are the metrics for, for moving to these new stages? You know, we've heard it's not to do with the number of cases, although it was maybe uh, mentioned in, in one of Dr. Muscat's answers earlier that if we do see cases going up, we might have to look accordingly. Um, is it, you know, 10 people in hospital, 20 people in hospital, 2,000 cases, 3,000 3, cases? You know, what is the kind of number that you're looking at before moving? I don't know if Richard wants to come in on that or Ivan, but I'll kind of say that um, in essence we are avoiding giving a number in the same way as we've avoided giving certain numbers. We've had similar questions in the past actually, uh, you know, different areas. Um, and I mean, uh, because it's always based on the information you've got at that point in time and looking ahead. It is, it is, fundam it is around hospitalizations and the levels but it will also depend, uh, it won't necessarily mean, so if you had a, uh, a high hospitalisation rate today, for the sake of argument, but you know that part of that is because of elective surgery, you know that's going to be reducing down, then you might not be reacting as opposed to, um, for whatever reason, you've got a high level of hospitalisation because of flu, for the sake of argument, that might engender a different response. So it will depend on the circumstances you're facing at the day. I'm going to stop there because it's definitely um, 
uh, uh, Richard Nyland's territory. Richard, do you want to add anything to that? Well, yes, I do. Um, yeah. it's, it's looking at a number of factors, and just one number, whether number of cases or number in hospital is not the deciding factor. It, it's about how the public are responding to appeals to keep the community safe. It's about vaccination uptake. Uh, it, it's about are there any changes in, in the virus. Um, there are all sorts of things to take into account which are constantly being held in, in balance and, and monitored and reported to us for consideration. Uh, and uh, that's why I can understand the temptation to say, well, what's the number you need? But it, it's just not that easy, and we, we can't do it. It wouldn't be right to, to do that. OK. okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, in summary, it's a collection of variables that have to be taken into account. Um, and, and it's actually going to be more complex this coming winter, because in addition to COVID as a result of reconnection, we have to contend with uh, influenza, which we didn't have last year, so we expect that to be more, more evident this year. Uh, RSV is already more evident, and that will become uh, uh, more so in the ensuing months. Um, so it's a question of uh, the overall stress on the health service, um, and of course the overall stress on businesses um, who uh, uh, re reflect infection rates in contradistinction to uh, the health service that reflects really uh, uh, the, the severity of infection that's being seen, which has been attenuated hugely, of course, by vaccination. Um, but it's a number of different factors and the interaction of them that needs to be taken into account. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank all. you. Thank you. Right. We'll go to Harry, and then after it will be Tom. So Harry, online. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, half term is coming up next week. Uh, children might be mixing a bit more, obviously, out of school. Uh, Halloween is coming up. I'm sure especially younger children want to be going out trick or treating. Um, is there any particular advice for young people over the half term? Can, can they have a relatively normal uh, half term? Can they go out and, and mix together in, in groups and, and go trick or treating? Can they be normal? Is there any particular advice uh, for them? And combined with that, um, obviously, 12 to 15 year olds can get a vaccine at, at Fort Regent and um, they've been told, obviously, when they're in school to go probably after school to get it. But now the schools are off. Is there going to be more appointments offered through the half term for 12 to 15 year olds? And take up has been a bit slow. There have been some who've got it, obviously, but a lot in that age group who haven't. And um, what would you say to, to, to 12 to 15 year olds about the importance of, of getting uh, their vaccine? Oh, I'll send that all down to Ivan and Richard, I think. Um, it, it, it is important that uh, uh, everyone takes the opportunity uh, to be vaccinated against COVID and against flu if they're eligible for it. And, and um, uh, th we, we, we uh, would ask, urge individuals to do so as soon as possible before uh, we are more heavily into winter when respiratory viruses uh, are more uh, easily transmitted. Um, we have only uh, opened up the uh, 12 to 15 year old cohort for uh, uh, vaccination some three weeks ago. The uptake uh, so far has been about 20% of that age group. Uh, so there's still a long way to go. And you're right to uh, indicate that uh, people should take the opportunity during the, their time off in half term, if they're on island, to be vaccinated. The, the, the centre is most certainly open over half term and will be accepting uh, uh, appointments from all age groups that are eligible for vaccination, and that obviously includes 12 to 15 year olds. Okay. And can I just oh, ask, yes. just based on that first question about half-term, Halloween parties, children mixing together, any particular advice? Okay. The general advice would be to consider who people mix with. Uh, if it's fine weather, stay outside, or if you're inside, uh, try and ventilate the rooms. Um, uh, and, and our general advice is to just watch ourselves to protect ourselves by wearing a mask in, in close spaces, uh, in close spaces where there might be vulnerable people. Uh, 
But otherwise, I hope that children will enjoy this half term. Uh, you know, they, they've, their schooling's been affected. Uh, they deserve to enjoy half term. And uh, we're bringing out those LFT testing kits for everyone over 12 years of age. Please let, they must take them up. That's the best thing that they could do to make sure that they and their families stay safe. Because they might think that they're not too much at risk and if they got COVID, it wouldn't be too bad. But of course, by keeping testing themselves, uh, even getting vaccinated, which we want to encourage, of course, uh, they will be protecting the older generations. Uh, might be their grandparents or the vulnerable people around them. So that's why it's important for younger people to take those measures. Thank you, Harry. Uh, okay. Thank you. And for my, my second question, can I yep. ask about uh, more older age groups, uh, those in maybe the vulnerable categories, care homes, uh, for example? We, we've heard before that, and um, I think you said that there probably will be fluctuations over this winter. Cases will rise at some points and they'll drop at others. Um, and we've seen over in the UK, there are a lot of cases there. We've heard about possible new variants. This Delta Plus has been mentioned in the, in the last week or so. Um, so with that and the possibility of cases rising and and obviously older people being at more risk, even though obviously they've got the, the booster dose. Is there any particular advice for, for older people, more vulnerable people? Should they change their behaviours? Should they stop meeting as many people as they would during the summer, for example? Is there any particular advice for those in the more vulnerable uh, and older age groups? We've always uh, advised uh, uh, people um, to uh, undertake activity that they feel safe with. Um, and have, uh, as you know, uh, uh, published on the website uh, and, and in print uh, those more uh, safe uh, activities that people can undertake, uh, meeting outdoors, uh, using well-ventilated spaces of indoors, uh, mixing with the same group of people, mixing with small numbers of people and so forth. Uh, being vaccinated, of course, is hugely, hugely important. That includes flu now. Um, uh, if they feel safer wearing masks in indoor spaces, then we would, uh, especially public places, then we would uh, strongly recommend that. Um, uh, of hygiene, hand and respiratory is important as well. Um, uh, but again, LFTs are, uh, come into this equation too. Uh, they, uh, people visiting care homes can undertake lateral flow tests before uh, they visit to make sure that they're safe, that they can't infect individuals. Uh, and lateral flow tests can be used more freely in care homes uh, as well. So a combination of all those things will help. In terms of the variant that you mentioned, the AY42, uh, that is a, a, a version of the Delta. Uh, it may be slightly more transmissible. There's no evidence that it escapes the vaccination, uh, um, the vaccines that we have. Um, and it is not at the moment even a variant under investigation, but people nonetheless, uh, despite the absence of that label, are investigating it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Tom. Good afternoon, uh, Ministers, Dr. Muscat, uh, Tom Innes from the Jersey Evening Post. On uh, vaccination, we've, we've um, talked about incentivising and there have been um, repeated uh, entreaties to uh, islanders to take up the message of vaccination, but uh, still a, a very a, a stubborn and quite large proportion who haven't. Um, 16 and 17 year olds have uh, been offered the vaccine since early August and around half haven't taken it up. Um, there's still around 30% of uh, 18 to 29 year olds. Are, you, um, are there any concrete things that you can do to drive these up? I know you can keep the message of protect yourself, protect others, help the island, but that doesn't seem to be getting through. Uh, um, there are um, a vaccine, uh, a vaccination certificates in the UK, but um, you, you've said before that you aren't keen on those. If, if you aren't going to press ahead with those uh, stick measures, what, what, what concrete measures are you going to do to drive those quite disappointing, I, I, I think people would agree, numbers up? Um, I think... Uh might have hand some of that over to Ivan and, and, and Richard particularly, um, and I noticed Lyndon's been uh, say, is saved uh, from having to say too much tonight as well, as oh, sorry, tonight uh, lunchtime even. But um, um, I think we've got to step back and say yes, whilst we continue to actively encourage 
uh, the age groups particularly that you talked about that haven't uh, taken up the vaccines yet. Um, equally, if you stand back and compare our vaccination rates, we are still pretty highly vaccinated to have an effective strategy or to enable us to have a, a slightly different approach because of a high vaccination level. And of course, um, uh, and this is why we keep emphasising, although in particularly in the younger age groups, you may not be as seriously affected by COVID-19 directly, but the vaccination actually significantly helps because it's about limiting uh, um, that impact and therefore limiting that spread as it goes up into the older generations where it has a much greater impact. Uh, I think that's, that's where I'm going to pause before, I'm, before I start risking treading into highly technical and medical areas. But um, Ivan, do you want to add anything more, or Richard, or, or Linda? Um, the, we must continue to uh, encourage people to be vaccinated based on the perceived benefits of vaccination, mm. perceived and real benefits of vaccination, both for themselves and for others. And, and that is really the, the, the most important point about vaccination. Um, we have repeatedly discussed uh, uh, the, the equivalent of a pass sanitaire. Uh, to date, that does not appear to be necessary or, or an attractive uh, option. Um, but as we were saying earlier, um, uh, our response to COVID has to be flexible because uh, COVID is not a static uh, entity. It, uh, it is a, a moving uh, uh, target and, it, and we need to evolve uh, our responses uh, accordingly. So we will be open-minded about uh, everything, but of course we're trying very hard, as we said at the outset, not to uh, uh, be mandatory in our approach uh, as we uh, go into it, as we reap the benefits of vaccination so far, and emphasize that we will reap even greater benefits from vaccination if more people are vaccinated. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a community, during the summer, we've been able to be quite relaxed, and that's a good thing. But as we approach the winter, and as our strategy identifies, there are risks that uh, are, are arising. And I think our responsible young people will, will see that. And I hope that more of them, of course, will take up that option to be vaccinated, because that is a, a measure that uh, not only protects them, but also the, the whole community. And, and so far, we've achieved our good vaccination rates uh, without using those sticks that you've referred to, without any sort of coercion. Uh, and I want to keep it that way. I think it would be wrong to resort to uh, those sort of measures that we've seen in some parts of the UK uh, and in France. I hope we can. Okay. Great. Right. Second question. Thank you. Um, should we try and finish on um, some good news? Um, uh, well, you, you can correct me if this uh, isn't good news. But a year ago, we were hearing the first um, concrete news about a vaccination, and uh, uh, it duly arrived in December and has made a significant difference. Um, in, in recent days, we've um, uh, read about the new antiviral drugs, Ritonavir and Molnupiravir. Uh, that it's um, just to like to ask well probably doc, dr. Muscat about the um, development of those uh, 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 how um, they are coming together and in the same way that Jersey got vaccines once the UK had them approved for use will that happen with the antivirals the the uh, uh, presence of uh, antivirals on the immediate horizon is very welcome news indeed uh, and that will uh, uh, complete, if you like, the uh, armamentorium that will be available to us against COVID. Um, Molnupiravir uh, is uh, an orally available agent. Um, uh, I understand the UK have arranged to buy 48,000 doses. The MHRA uh, uh, have yet to uh, uh, approve it, and that approval will. Uh, uh, delineate how we should use it. Um, it does reduce the hospitalization rate from 14% to 7% in the clinical trials that have been undertaken with that drug. Uh, so it is very attractive indeed. The side effect profile is essentially the same as the placebo that was used in the trials. Um, 
uh, but I haven't got a date for when it will be introduced, but it will be available in Jersey in the same way as it is in the UK. Um, uh, the uh, the, the uh, other drug that's uh, also on the horizon is a protease inhibitor linked to ritonavir. Uh, one, is one version of that is available intravenously for hospital use only. The other is a, will be available orally. Again, that has not been uh, uh, authorized yet, uh, but the clinical trials are, are very promising. Um, uh, and again, that will make a big difference to uh, the, the, the uh, outcomes of uh, COVID infection. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Well, I think uh, on that basis, it's just after half past one. Although we started slightly late, uh, I think we'll um, try and close. I think hopefully everybody feels they've done enough questions. Um, but as we close today, can I just thank the members of the media for your questions and also for all of you for watching. As we've said, the success of our vaccination program has allowed us to take a slightly different uh, approach this winter, one which emphasizes the importance of individual responsibility and minimizing unnecessary disruption to Islanders' lives, education, or jobs. But the risk of COVID remains, so if you or someone you know, as we've said today, have not yet gotten vaccinated, please, please do so. Please take that extra thought to minimise your risk of transmission by meeting in smaller groups or outdoors if you can. And remember, you can now get your own lateral flow testing kits delivered for free directly to your door from Tuesday the 26th of October. It is only with your continued help and support that we can limit the spread of the virus and properly manage the virus during this winter. But thank you for listening today and we'll bring this to a close.